Cool. Thank you. Move for sound. Oh, yep. Lovely. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Craig. I work at Hyvent. Um, today's talk is really going to be about incident response from the perspective of crisis management and looking at some interesting clinical models that actually talk about the way people handle uh, people under medical care and how they actually deal with crisis and then sort of comparing that to what actually happens during a standard cyber incident response. Um, I am a, a lot I like to say, a reform nerd. Um, I used to be technical, um, but compared to guys like you know, Ed Farrell and Kane Norton, I'm a lowly noob, so and I'm okay with that. What I do spend a reasonable amount of time doing, though, is coordinating IR, either helping organisations plan an IR capability and IR frameworks, or actually assisting organisations in the throes of an incident. Um, I've worked on cases that uh, relate to criminal activities, um, arguably nation-state stuff, depending if you believe in the internet boogeyman, and uh, activist incidents as well. So I've seen quite a variety of different types of incidents with different motivations, all the way ro ranging from purely business-based, I'm going to make money out of your business, all the way through to people who have a, an emotional or a political need to get a message across. So, Luddites. So, um, one of the reasons why I, I wrote this talk was I it was in a, a conversation with a customer who made the, the offhand comment that I am just a Luddite. I am, you know, I'm not tech enough to understand, I'm not tech enough to be useful. And the background of Luddites was actually um, there were a, a group of uh, people in the, about the 19th century who started to rise up against the increasing automation, particularly in cotton and, and wool milling at the time. So in some ways it's kind of similar to what we're seeing where organisations are becoming more and more heavily focused on automation, uh, orchestration, heavily technical focused uh, responses to, to incidents. And those of us that are slightly less technical start to feel like we, uh, you know, we don't have as much to, to offer. So for those of you in the room, let's just do a quick show of hands. Who would say that they, based on that sort of definition, would consider themselves to be a bit of a Luddite? Great. I've got news for you. Today's the day. We are going to join forces and raise up against the oppression and tyranny of tech oppression. Luddites, we are awesome. For those of you that didn't raise your hand, you're like, oh, shit. It's like all the managers are out of control. We're going to be documentation everywhere and policies. No, we'll be fine. So, why is uh, incident response cool? Um, basically, incident response fills a gap for an emotional need for a, uh, the technical guys around being the guy that comes in and saves the day. If you compare your traditional penetration tester who comes in, drops an amazing O day, totally owns the organisation, puts it into a document, hands the report to the customer who then goes, great, we're going to risk accept that. That is an emotional response, it's pretty bloody awful. However, as an incident responder, you get to save the day. You get to play with all the cool tech. Um, you get sexy bad guys. You've got, I've got Chinese hackers from Iran that are like using North Korean tech and they're owning everything. And you get to sound really, really awesome. And the best thing is, is as an incident responder, you get to save the day. You only turn up when an organisation is having their worst day ever and you are the solution to that problem. So as an emotional uh, need or an emotional response, that feels pretty bloody good. The reality for us mere mortal managers, incident coordinators, incident managers is a lot different. Incidents are painful. They mean that you are going to have a lot of time uh, dealing with people uh, above you, more senior than you, communicating with them. You're going to get all sorts of awkward questions and frankly, you're going to spend a lot of time just herding cats. But as an incident coordinator or an incident manager, this is actually your time to shine and it has actually a critical role in any sort of incident response capability. So one of the things I noticed around incident response is that it is infested with TLAs, two le three letter acronyms and four letter acronyms. That's basically because incident responders are too busy to use full words and sentences. So you load up your, your sticks in the taxi with your IOCs and you put that into the scene and all of a sudden you've got this whole gobbledygook language but for the people that are not really that technical that starts to lose any meaning. So it's, there's actually a barrier there of communication between the people who are trying to manage the incident and the people that are actually trying to get shit done. 
Um, the one thing to bear in mind, though, is that during an incident, the fundamentals of InfoSec basically don't change. It's a resources game. Whoever has the most resources wins, and generally it's weight, weighted towards the bad guys. They only have to find one hole or one weakness. You, get to, you have to plug all of them. So from a manager, you need to continue to challenge and question the tech response and make sure that your response is appropriate, it's efficient, and it's effective. Um, now, most but not all true uh, cybersecurity incidents tend to unfold as a crisis. They don't always deserve this level of drama, but that tends to occur, uh, mostly because people's preparation and execution of incident response frameworks is pretty crap. So what that does is drive people to a panic response or a crisis response, and then starts to drive their behaviours from there. And we'll look through some of those in a moment. Often you'll see that incidents are, are really a human or an organisational issue, um, but these incident responders will try and find a technical solution for it. Now, uh, uh, Christina, uh, Kitty, presented a great talk yesterday where she was talking about so the interaction between the human and the machine and having a human controlling a machine actually provides a weakness. I've seen instances like this where during an incident you have a human making a decision about systems, they make the wrong decision and all of a sudden the incident gets a lot worse. So one recently, it seemed very simple and, and sort of benign but actually made life pretty difficult, was a, a, an organisation were being hit with a fairly light denial of service attack. Nothing out of the ordinary. The firewall admin decided that what he would do would be block that traffic on the firewall. Sure, that kind of makes sense. Until the firewall state tables filled up and the whole thing was bought. They lost all connectivity. So they went from having sort of a reduction in connectivity and, and some, some delays in the way their website was being presented to the whole thing dropped. Now that's not because the firewall did anything wrong. The firewall did exactly what it was meant to do but it was the decision made without checking and analysis and sanity checking around how to use the firewall that became the problem. So, despite what the uh, tech vendors uh, will tell you and, and IR specialists, the Luddite has a crucial role to play. Um, one of the things that a, a, an incident manager or an incident coordinator will do is provide focus. Only solve the problem you need to solve. You don't need to go and put out every single spot fire, you just need to pick the major one and solve that first. Sanity checking, as I said, you end up in situations where people make decisions and you need to be the person that is asking the questions around, but what will happen if we, if we do that? But why do you think that is the appropriate response? Have you checked that with a peer? That kind of constant questioning, while somewhat painful at times, is actually very, very useful in ensuring that decisions are made are effective and appropriate. Um, another one that I like to call guarding the fan is basically being the person that prevents the shit hitting the fan. To kind of stand like that and make sure that nothing sprays beyond you. Uh, and the last one is uh, executive distraction or executive communication. You know, executives get very nervous uh, when you have a, an incident, primarily because they've lost uh, control and often they're out of their depth technically. So your role as an incident manager is to make sure that they are getting enough information that they understand that it is in hand, or if it's not in hand, if it needs to be escalated, and ensuring that basically they stay out of the way. The last thing you want is an executive coming to help. Um, sorry, I meant to say, if anyone's got questions as I go, please just sing out. I'll try and repeat it for the crowd. Um, I know we've got lunch at the end, so everyone's going to race off. So if you've got questions, fire them in as we go. Um, okay, so incident types. Um, so most incidents will fall into sort of one or more of these categories. Sometimes they'll be combined and sometimes they'll exist on their own. Now these are intentionally simplistic, but you'll have a, a denial of service. Um, that can be both technical and now what is becoming more uh, prevalent is a financial denial of service, where actually you smash someone's, say, AWS account until their credit card runs out of funds, things like that. Uh, defacement, takeover of public sites, including social media. You know, you take over someone's Twitter account and profess their love for Katy Perry, something like that. Uh, data breach and exfiltration and malware. Realistically, for, for the typical organisation, you really only need to have an incident response plan for those four categories. That will give you enough to coordinate responses, get the right resources in play and begin to address the issues you're seeing. If you have 
20 different playbooks, you probably have too many. How do you know which one of those 20 is the right one for a given incident? So, what, we'll, what I'll be looking through today is the CDC crisis continuum. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's, a, uh, it's used for clinical purposes for nurses and medical specialists to identify where someone is in, in, a, in a stage of crisis and what the appropriate responses are. So it talks about different physiological responses and behaviours during a crisis. Um, there's a lot of things in there where if you picture your manager or your executive during a crisis, there's a lot of things in there that seem eerily familiar. So this is the continuum. You, know, you go from stage one, everything's generally okay, to stage four, which is, holy shit, everything is on fire. We'll go through each of those. So pre-crisis pre is really around um, being aware that crisis is able to happen, and it is a possibility, and being prepared around that. Um, as I said before, having playbooks that are really detailed generally doesn't help. If your playbook is more than a sort of an A4 double-sided piece of paper, that's probably too big, in my opinion. Um, do you know what normal looks like? For a lot of organisations, the challenge for them in uh, performing an incident response capab capability or an incident response is that they don't know what normal looks like. They don't know when it's over. They need some reference to say, this has stopped being bad and we can now get back to BAU. The way you do that is to identify thresholds and canaries. A canary is a leading indicator that something's up. It's not a def definitive, you know, we are now in crisis. It's a, this looks a bit weird, we need to know something about that. An example might be, you're an Australian online business, you only have Australian customers, and all of a sudden you're getting a lot of patronage from Russia. That would be a canary. That would be, that's a bit odd, not sure why that's the case, we should probably look into that a bit more. A threshold would be, we normally get uh, 10,000 connections a minute, we now have 15,000. You've now breached a threshold, that means you need to get into action. Um, some of the other things is uh, executive awareness. Getting executives aware of um, what happens during a cyber incident and what their role to play is and how they can be involved in decision making is quite critical. And the other one where organisations often fall over during an incident is a chain of command. There's no clear uh, way that someone knows who they should escalate up to to get a decision made. And if that person is not available, what is their next step? Are they able, are they enabled to make a decision on their behalf? Do they need to go find someone else? All of those sorts of things are massively inhibiting during an incident. So these are the things that before the crisis unfolds, an organisation needs to ensure that they have in place. Um, so normal. Normal is sort of, you know, there's a normal stress and anxiety level. Background um, is basically minor annoyances, that sort of thing. This is generally where the canaries will come in. Things are just kind of normal, but every now and again something's a bit, bit off and we're just going to look into it. Um, usually what happens is that organisations post-incident look back and go, we should have known then, that was the sign. We don't sell anything in Russia, of course, but that's the point where organisations are able to better install capabilities, either technical or procedural, to ensure that they're able to identify those issues in future. Um, Kane Norton presented an awesome talk yesterday. He was talking about logging and basically log everything you can. Logging is critical. The more you can get into your data, uh, data stores, the better your chances are of identifying trends and outliers that are meaningful in the, in the sense of, of an incident. Um, the other thing is that being aware that business thresholds will typically s spike or break before, business one, before technological ones will. A great example of this is if you're seeing, if your organisation is seeing the spate of um, account stuffing attacks at the moment, account lockouts. An account lockout from a technological perspective, perfect. You, know, you tried your password three times, you didn't get it right, locked. From a business perspective, you now have hundreds and hundreds and thousands of customers who now can't get access to their account because their credentials were being attempted to be breached. That as a business uh, threshold is something that an IT team needs to be aware of because that is absolutely a leading indicator that something is up. So what else can you consider during stage one? Cyber insurance. Uh, Mina, yes, uh, yesterday, today, talked about cyber insurance. Cyber insurance, I, I do get asked relatively frequently about, you know, is it a great idea or not? Um, I don't know. 
uh, it, it's, it's a very challenging area. You've got uh, the question of cost if no investment. So if I don't pay 10 grand in, in premiums every year and no, nothing happens for five years, I've saved 50 grand. That's a really sort of challenging uh, argument to try and weigh up against. The benefit that I would point out about cyber insurance, however, is that there is a lot of additional benefits that organisations rarely take full advantage of. Things like having access to advice, having access to pre-vetted resources, and having support during an incident. From this, the insurer's perspective, it is in their absolute best interest to make sure that you are as capable and as geared up as possible to cope with an incident. So they offer a lot of advice and support and resources and tools that you can get access to as an insured customer that you may not otherwise get access to. So if you are considering insurance or you have cyber insurance, I would strongly recommend talking to your insurer about what are these additional benefits that you can get access to and make full use of them. So, stage two, uh, heightened condition, rapidly, rapid heart rate and respiration. Um, people might appear lost or confused. You might have managers kind of walking the halls in circles, not quite sure what's going on. Voice may be pitched higher or quaver when talking. That is a sure sign of a manager who knows that they're about to get a visit from an exec. And I can see a few smiles here. I think everyone recognises that, that sort of mental image. Usually what this is is, something is behaving strangely. Something's up, we don't quite know why, we don't quite know what, but there is a problem. Um, one of the big things that happens here is customer service, uh, if you have like an outward facing customer service line, and service desk internally. They are the canaries for you in this, in this case because they are the ones that see the business level issues and they may also see the system level issues. Having a really good relationship with both of those teams is very critical for an incident responder, for a, you know, a cyber uh, manager of, of some description, because they are the ones that will let you know that something's up and you need to start doing a bit of digging. The other one is communications. At this point, communications is quite critical, but you need to be clear about who you tell and what you tell them. If you don't have anything definitive, how do you communicate internally that we think something's a bit weird? So having some really clear guidance around what do we communicate, who do we communicate it to, and when do we do that will make your life easier. It may be just about agreeing with the marketing comms team that in the event that something looks a bit odd, we just send out a, a blanket email that says, hey, something looks a bit odd, we're looking into it, we'll come back to you if we know anything more. That is usually sufficient to keep people at bay and allow you to get into the nitty gritty of, of the issue. The harder one is what you tell your customers. If you don't have anything definitive to say, in general, the rule of thumb is that you better not to say it until you have something meaningful and reliable that you can go out publicly with. The other one is a regulator. If you are uh, subject to some sort of regulatory body, be aware that at some point you are probably going to have to tell them that something's up, being very clear about what that is, when you told them, and what you're expecting from them is going to be quite crucial. Um, the relationship with most regulators these days is in these sorts of incidents is actually pretty friendly and quite um, pragmatic. Regulators, in my experience, generally like being given a quick heads up, hey, we think there's something up, um, we're seeing some abnormal activity, just letting you know, but we're on to it. That is far better than contacting them six weeks after the fact saying we got owned and it was terrible. You, the proactive nature of it will serve you well in the long run. Severe stress and anxiety. Something bad has definitely happened. This is getting to the oh shit moment. Um, person's reasoning and capacity is seriously diminished. What generally happens is people start clutching at straws. Everything looks like a Russian hacker. Everything is bad. That server has never done that before. Um, all sorts of things. People just start blaming whatever they can because they're trying to make sense of the situation. Communication may include shouting, swearing, argumentation and threats. Absolutely. You will see colleagues who work together quite well normally all of a sudden butt heads about what is the best course of action, is that an appropriate threshold, that sort of thing. You'll also get a lot of uh, conflicting views on origin, impact, uh, the extent of the incident, this sort of thing. From the Luddites perspective, this is your time to shine. This is when you get in there and you start showing your stuff. The big thing for, at this point is, what do we know for sure? 
you need to keep repeating that question. What can we reliably prove? If we can't reliably prove it, where do we get the data that will allow us to do that? As we go, that kind of data and questioning will allow you to separate the wheat from the chaff and be able to focus and ensure that you're only solving the problem that needs to be solved. The other thing to bear in mind here is generally mistakes made at this stage tend to compound massively later on. If you get it wrong here, you will definitely have a bad day later on. So it's quite important to make sure that you're not burning time uh, chasing down uh, something that's you know, a, a mistake or someone's sure that that database has been owned and it hasn't. So you need to be very precise and very continually challenging the sources of data and the reliability of that data. So some of the common issues we see um, you know, as, the, as the crisis starts to escalate, um, insufficient quantity and quality of data. As Kane said yesterday, log everything. Um, inability to get decisions made is a big one. You, if you are unable to get an executive to make a decision, often the, the decision will be made for them, which is not what you want. You want to remain in control of the situation as much as possible. Um, there is a lot of noise. There's a lot of people trying to come to help. There's a lot of people adding their sort of valuable input and opinion, which is generally not what you need. So at this point, it's about reducing noise and maximizing available data. Um, you can talk about having you know, too many chefs spoiling the broth, uh, too many chiefs, not enough Indians, too many managers and versus people that actually do and know useful stuff. Um, prioritization is a big one, trying to ensure that you know what is the most important thing to fix. From a business perspective, what do we care about and what does success look like? If you don't understand what success or victory looks like at this stage, you're going to have a hell of a time trying to figure out what an appropriate response is. And again, if we go back a few stages and we talk about canaries and thresholds, if you've set canaries and thresholds, really your aim should be to get them back down. If you said that um, you know, 10,000 requests a, a minute is normal, then your focus should be getting it back down to 10,000 requests. Or at the very least, understanding why it has spiked. Stage four, this is, this is crisis. Everything is now um, bad. Um, unbearable anxiety. Uh, loss, my favorite one here is loss of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral control. I've actually seen managers do the closest thing to a table flip and just completely panic. Um, that does happen because people are generally not in control of the situation. Invariably, they don't understand the technical aspects of it, and generally, it panic sets in. Um, Behaviours of a person in crisis are erratic and unpredictable. You will get people make all sorts of strange decisions that in the cold light of day they cannot explain why they thought that was a good idea, but they will make those decisions. The role of the Luddite is to ensure that that does not happen. Your role is to guard the fan, get the right data sources, challenge the data and ensure that the right decisions are being made. At this stage, everything's on fire. Everything's bad. You've got problems everywhere. Um, you need to take a step back. Facts versus theories. Going back to the concept of what can we reliably prove? Why, can, why is that reliable? Where did we get the data from? What does it mean? Business priorities are quite, quite critical in allowing you to determine what is the best course of action. Um, often you will see um, particularly coordinated attacks where you may see an attack uh, led off with a denial of service, which keeps you busy. Meanwhile, there has been a, um, a breach and data exfil, something like that. So from your perspective, you need to understand at a business level what is the most important thing so I can prioritize my time and resources accordingly. The other thing about the, the, the role of the Luddite is it is not your job to provide answers. The, you let the experts do their thing. Your role is to provide the structure and dare I say the environment, that they have got the best chance of getting you through this incident with as few bruises as possible. You are, you are there to make sure that they are not distracted and that they are focusing on the right things. Um, so during an incident, um, the bad guys are often you know, the, the least of your concerns. To them, this is generally a, a business transaction, particularly if it's an organized crime, uh, if you've got something like um, a denial of service at attack and, and you're being hit for bitcoins or something like that. Realistically, you just want to make life difficult enough for them that they go elsewhere. 
You don't need to be the best, you just need to not be the worst. So you, you, know, you roll something like Casada out, make their life really difficult and expensive, they go away and move on to the next person. Um, there is obviously an edge case here where you have people that are either politically or emotionally charged and this is basically a personal thing for them. At that point, really it's about determining is that going to go away anytime soon and how do we address that both at a technological level and potentially at a business level. So, who are the real bad guys? If during an incident, the guys that are attacking you, or people, I'm sorry for the ladies, if the folks that are attacking you are um, not, not the baddies, who are they? The enemy is within. This is Simon. Simon works on service desk. Um, he has seen sneakers, hackers, and war games. He is a wannabe hacker. He, he's dying to get involved. The thing to do with Simon is to find a useful task for him. You want him out of the way and you want to ensure that his time is being used usefully for your purposes. So with, with a, a person like Simon, generally I try and get them researching similar attacks elsewhere in the world and trying to get some insight into what is the motivation of the attacker. People like Simon love that role. They want to be useful, they want to help and they want to show off their skills. Great. Maximise that skill set give them something to do. This is Bob. Bob loves to tell you that this incident is nothing compared to the great database outage of 2014. This is nothing. He has seen it all. He's been with the company you know, since probably the Luddite era. Um, he basically doesn't give a shit that you're having a bad day and he wants to tell you about how much worse he had it when he was a kid. The great thing about Bob is that he has been here for so long and he knows the organisation so well, he knows where all the bodies are buried. His ability to understand the linkages between different applications, all of the stuff that never gets documented in an organisation is great. Bob's role for you is to be that maven of the organisation. The person you go to and go, hey Bob, what would happen if I turned off this database? I bet you that that documentation doesn't exist, but it lives in Bob's head. Bob is an extremely useful individual, but Bob is not someone that you want to be offering advice. You want Bob to be a person that is a sounding board for ideas and concepts. Uh, this is Chip, or Chuck, or one of those sort of names. Um, he's a micromanager. He, he really, really wants to be important and to be seen by the executives as helping, showing leadership, taking initiative, whoops, all those sorts of things. So. He is probably the most dangerous person in, as an incident responder because he's the guy that will make a decision and go round you or talk to some of your resources and basically distract people. You can feel his need to be that person who's taking ownership and leadership of the role by saying, great, Chuck, Chip, Buzz, all those sorts of good names. Your role is now to communicate with the executives. Every 15 minutes, I want you to send an email to the executives with where things are up to. That's it. You have now established a layer between you and the executives. You've filled his emotional need to be involved and you've given yourself one less job to do. This guy is really important, but you need to handle him really carefully. So, they're not such bad folks. You know, th they want to help. They want to get involved and do the right thing for the organisation. But realistically, they are going to make your life pretty difficult. So you need to ensure that you're able to keep them at bay and used successfully for what you want. Um, the, the key thing is to ensure that you recognise what their emotional need is, like what is it that they want to do, and find a task that address that really quickly. Um, one of the things, particularly with CHIP, is ensuring that even if there are no new updates in terms of that we don't know anything else, is providing that upwards communication to management saying, we're still working on it. We don't have any answers yet, we'll let you know. We'll come back to you in every 15 minutes. Set a schedule, meet it every time. If you miss that, if you send an email on the 16th minute, you can guarantee someone will come down and ask what's happening. Send it at 14 minutes. That sort of thing is really crucial. It's the responsibility of the incident manager, the Luddite, uh, to identify and delegate upwards to an incident owner, Chip or Chuck or someone like that. You want to put a layer between you and the executives to ensure that you can be focused on doing what you need to do and the executives can have a feeling that this is under control. Um, 
Often you want to be able to liaise with the marketing communications people as well and ensure that your messaging is appropriate for the executives. I guarantee if you send the executives an email saying we've just loaded sticks in the taxi, you're going to get a very different response to we're looking for signatures for malware, we think we'll be fine, we're working on it. <coughs> Things like that are really crucial to an executive. All right, engaging an IR expert. Um, ideally, you've already done this. Generally, probably not. This is usually about the time where I get a phone call. Um, be very aware of responders bearing gifts of appliances and licenses. And a, a responder invariably shouldn't need additional kit or licenses or need to sell you anything other than their time and expertise. If they are trying to sell you a box, be very careful. Um, be ready to provide lots and lots of data and be aware, uh, be ready for the uncomfortable silence when the responder asks you, do you have this logged? And you say no. You will get that awkward stare, it's okay, that's kind of what we're expecting, but that is the type of question that you're going to get. So as much information as you can have ready is going to make the, the responder's life a lot easier. Um, the other thing is being clear about what do you want them to provide. When the responder arrives, what is it that you need them to do? Do you want them to provide attribution? Who is doing this and why are they doing it? Do you want them to try and figure out how bad this is? Particularly if you've got a data breach, do you want them to be able to tell you where all your data's gone? Does that matter at this stage? Um, resolution of the incident, do you want someone like myself to turn up and go, it's all right, we're going to get this sorted, I need this sort of information, and you basically want someone to hold their hand and get them through the incident, or is it something else entirely? If you, if you are you know, calling a Kane or an, uh, like Ed Farrell or someone like that, you're probably wanting a really technical response. You want someone to dig into the detail and tell you exactly what's going on. That's fine, but you need to be aware of what you want out of the engagement in order to ensure that you actually get the right skill set and you use it effectively. So, for the paranoid, uh, legal privilege. I am not a lawyer, but you probably should consider covering your ass. If you have reason to be concerned about litigation as a result of the incident, um, you may want to consider the manner in which you engage uh, an incident responder. So any reports that get issued to you by the IR organisation can be subpoenaed at a later date through civil litigation, class action, that sort of thing. However, if your IR firm is engaged by your group counsel or a legal firm for the purposes of obtaining advice and all that sort of thing, it's able to be wrapped in legal privilege and cannot be subpoenaed at a later date. Now that said, if you are getting chased by like APRA or ASIC or someone like that, you're going to have a bad day, there's not a lot you can do about it. But if civil litigation is actually a consideration for you, there are some ways that you can minimise the damage to your organisation. Crisis resolution. In the after aftermath of a crisis, a uh, person who acted out may be ashamed of the outburst. We've all been there where a manager has then felt kind of awkward that they said, said some dumb things and made some bad decisions. The key thing at this point is to identify at what point has the incident become BAU? How do we know that we are back to business as usual? Who decides it and who communicates it? Organisations have, often have a real problem where they become addicted to the crisis. Certainly we saw that behaviour during WannaCry where organisations were using it as a way to smash in additional patching and that sort of thing, which is great. But if you become addicted to the crisis, it becomes very difficult to make a determination about at what point the crisis is over and we're back to business as usual. The reason why that is important is that you need to do a post-incident review. Post-incident reviews are absolutely critical in ensuring the next time you have an incident, its impact is lessened as much as possible. Um, I really recommend having uh, external facilitation and analysis during the post-incident re review. It doesn't necessarily need to, buy a to be done by a particularly technical person, but it needs to be someone who can get all of the stakeholders in a room and talk about what did we do, what went well, what didn't go well, how do we get better next time. That kind of knowledge and data and insight is crucial and is generally overlooked and undervalued. So, now what? You know, if you're looking at, at this talk, you're like, okay, well, you know, what, is, what should I get out of this? What, what do I do now? At a bare minimum, you should have some playbooks or run sheets. Um, those 
that's a snapshot of one that's available on Security Colony, but you know, some general high-level information that will provide some structure around your incident response capability. This one, oh cool, I get to use this. Uh, nope. Oh, this thing up here, usually that is who are your key contacts, what are their phone numbers, um, and what is their role? And a series of key questions around what am I doing? What is my part to play in the incident response? The one down the bottom there is really just a, a quick swim lane around what do we do next. Often as a, as a first responder, you're not quite sure about what is your next step. Do I need to call someone first? Do I reboot systems? Do I unplug something? What should I do? This is a very quick guidebook to ensure that you always know what's next or what decision needs to be made. A top drawer letter is a great thing to have. It's basically a, a pre-written letter that you would issue out to the public or to a regulator or something like that. It's your, it's your typical letter that says something's bad has happened, we're looking into it, we take the, our response seriously, that sort of thing. Um, chain of command, establishing a really clear and reliable chain of command around who can make what decisions when and what happens if that person's away. You can guarantee an incident will happen at 2 a.m. on a Sunday or right in the middle of the grand final or something like that when all the people you need are generally not available. So when that happens, what are you enabled to, what decisions are you enabled to make? And if you're not, who can you get decisions made by? Have, a, have an IR partner, formal or informal. It may just be a matter of saying, hey, um, you know, random security company, if we have an incident, we're going to call you guys. Or it could be all the way through to having a proper retainer, depending on your organisational appetite. But you need to know in the event that an issue happens, who are you going to call? Last thing, again, logging. Logging is critical. Log everything. Uh, and that's it. Whoop. So, as a Luddite, you should feel like the, uh, the good fairy of the East, the West, which is basically you're able to walk into an incident scenario and say, relax, I got this. Thank you. <laughs> Looks like I've got about five minutes for questions or... Oh, it's a couple of minutes before lunch, but yeah, um, anyone have any questions? Thank you. She's not the one that gets squashed by a house, that's all I know. Anyone? Nope, all right, everyone gets a nerd. Oh, sorry, we've got one. So as you explained that as an incident manager, um, your main role is to coordinate between the experts and the uh, executives, but who, are, who should take the decisions in an incident. So let's say you have a group of experts and you're doing the management and the coordination between these guys and you had conflicting opinions or decisions. What would you do in such a case where you have like the technical experts with conflicting opinions yep. or decisions to be made? Yep, so that, that happens quite a lot. So the question is really around what happens when you get conflicting information, who makes the call? Um, the short answer is it depends. The longer answer is that's why you have chain of command. There should be someone who is enabled to make the decision. I often think that actually making the wrong decision is still better than making no decision because by making the wrong decision, you are still in control of the situation, even if you get it wrong. So generally, it's about making sure that the right people have all been heard, their inputs have been provided, and then the right person is in the place to make the decision about, this is what we do next. Often, it is the incident manager. It is the person who's trying to run things. Um, is that always the best person? Realistically, probably not, but you're the one that's sort of in the middle of it, and sometimes it's about gut instinct, and sometimes it's about making sure that the data supports that. Anyone else? Cool. Early mark for lunch. Oh, sorry, sir. Sorry, my bad. Oh, 